It's GHH. I'm Equality. Hey, Rob J10X. This is Gentleman's History Hour. Yes, yes, sir. How you doing, man? I'm feeling pretty good, man. I'm feeling like I'm, I'm feeling real, you know, dipset 135th, you know, just Dang. in my in that bag right now, you know. Yeah. Cameron up, you know, murder yeah. mace, yeah, all that's in my in my spirit. The spirit of Harlem, huh? Yeah, man. Yeah, just um, I know this this is this gonna air a little later, man, but um, you know, we feel in the spirit of of the of the Harlem Renaissance and in the spirit of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, 130 years ago, birth was the birth of uh Zora Neale Hurston, man. So oh, that's, uh, that's, that's a shout out to the ancestor Zora Neale Hurston on what would what would be her 130th. Wow, born man. Day. But you know, we jumping ahead of the game, man. This um, where well, you want to start diving at, man? When, you know, when you when you think about the Harlem Renaissance, what's the first thing that just pops in your mind? I first thing I pop in my mind is how did y'all get to Harlem? You know, I'm always yeah. intrigued. I'm always intrigued in this. You know pre-internet, pre probably even pre-phone yeah. in every house world. How do we yeah. communicate? So I think starting there. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people, when they think of the Harlem Renaissance, they go straight to the arts. Mm -hmm. And for me, especially with us doing this show, one thing it's taught me as a, as a person that, uh, that researches to, you know, to get everything together is uh, asking certain questions. Like you said, why Harlem? Yeah, most definitely. And how? Like, how did you, how did you make that trek? Um, one thing of, of, of note is the, you know, we always got to throw the dates out there. Man. Oh, we got to throw the dates out there, <laughs> hey, man. We, in Scholar Fred's name, you know what I'm saying? Like, 1916 gotta... through uh, 1940 was considered one of the, the great migrations. Most it was definitely. two migrations. Uh, 1916 to 1940 and then 1940 to 1970. We we're talking about the 1916 and 1940. And just to fill in the gap, too, uh, the reason I said, uh, brought up uh, Fred was because we left off when we were, um, you know, doing our last episode and we, we went back and we went up to the compromise uh, through the reconstruction. And this is where we're kind of picking up is, you know, post reconstruction, you know, a lot of the disdain and the fact that we still were even post post reconstruction we still were 40 percent of the south so voting wise you know uh, republican wise i mean we were they were really able to had a lot of power with having a voting base uh that big so it became re really a point of emphasis to disenfranchise black people um in particular for political gain and that kind of brought us to you know yeah yeah let's um let's paint the picture of um of why you had to migrate, and then how did you get word to know where to go? Hey, most definitely. How was word being spread back during that time in the in in the you know let's call it nineteen around nineteen sixty? So in that in in asking myself the why and picking off of what you said after that the, those years of Reconstruction became Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were quote unquote free, but then Jim Crow came and it was damn near just as bad as as, as being in slavery. Most definitely. So Most definitely. One is looking at what was going on during Jim Crow, 1915, the resurgence of the KKK came back mm -hmm. down south. So now you got Klan coming back, and then that was based off of, uh, an old movie, Birth of a Nation, which mm -hmm. was basically KKK propaganda. Mm. One of the most mm -hmm. racist movies in the history of a wow. of, uh, of film, which really, when we had an episode, we started really talking about Hollywood and film. We have to delve okay. into, into all of that. So you got that. And then it's, it's another thing um, that happened, which is weird. They had this, uh, the, the Bo Weevil, which was like this beetle mm -hmm. that was um, basically just terrorizing all of the cotton down oh, south. Wow. So they, they couldn't make no money. Wow, okay. It, it, if you're a sharecropper, you work in the fields, and this beetle is, is, is coming in. Wow, okay. Uh, may have originated in, in Mexico, but uh, the boll weevil, I think yeah. it's like B O L L. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's, just, it's, that's like a biblical play. <laughs> yeah. W E E. Let my people go, yeah. or I will strike your car. V I L or something <laughs> like the boll weevil. Yes, yeah. and it's a, it's a beetle that actually was, was just infesting all of the cotton. Wow, okay. So now the 
how am I gonna make money? Yeah, so now the war, South is you, you're dealing with Jim Crow, um, you're de dealing with riots, you're dealing with the resurgence of the Klan. Now the Bo Weevil, say the name. The Bo Weevil, the okay, Bo Weevil, Bo Weevil too. Bo, Bo Weevil raising hell. Yeah. And then World War One popping off too. Now World War One. Now we getting into them dates. The, the 1914 through 1917 was World War One. So why is World, World War One is important? Um, because it brought economic opportunity in the North. Hmm. So now we're painting a picture of these black folks want to migrate to go up north because it's job opportunities. Mm -hmm. The white men were going out to war and you had job opportunities. Okay. Now in Chicago, which was one of the places that, that people migrated to from the South, they had what they call unskilled labor jobs, but they needed black people to fill. These were like the cooks, the servants, okay. the cleaners, um, people that, that could clean or whatever. So you got this economic, it's like somebody saying, hey man, they got it's a lot of jobs in yeah. New York. Yeah. I know you don't like it. I know you don't like it down here. So you got uh with the war going on and one of the other things about world war one and the economic opportunity in the north is that um it shut down the the european immigrant migration hmm. so okay. now you're not even competing with the immigrants yeah, that were coming okay. in from europe yeah so that's a real opportunity we'll yeah. have to uh go back to this uh maybe on a future episode but mm -hmm. During World War One, at that point, we were able to enlist, but was it still kind yeah, of? Yeah, it was, it was about four hundred. It was about four hundred thousand blacks that were fighting. Were we getting in drafted in, or was that were we enlisting at that point? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't okay. know if, if if we were drafted or or enlisted, but uh, okay. I know a draft was going on. Okay, All so right. we we may have been drafted. I know uh, a lot of the, the white guys were in, enlisting and being drafted, so that that left a lot of industrial opportunity. In the okay. north, but how word was being spread. One, one of the, it was a couple of, couple of pivotal things in the migration. And you looking at the map, and they got these migration maps. So you look at Texas, Texas and Louisiana. Mm -hmm. They were going west. Hey, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I'm gonna so, go west coast. If I'm in Texas, <laughs> I'm thinking because I'm, uh, I'm going from a climate standpoint, it would make sense for me. You know, thinking about it logically, I understand even without the opportunity. I'm thinking if I'm living in the south. You know, hell is being brought down on me. Mm -hmm. I naturally would think I'm gonna go to the Union. They yeah. already won the war. I'm gonna assume that it's better there. You know, like, yeah, that's the assumption. You yeah. you want to get away. So Texas, Texas primarily they were going, um, they were going west coast to like uh, let's say L.A. and San Diego. Okay. The Louisiana, their migration, they were going to the west coast, but they were mo mostly going to the Bay Area. Mm, like okay. Oakland, okay. Know, so they were there. Now, then we look, and so Mississippi, places like Mississippi, they were going to Chicago. Then you had like North Carolina, South Carolina, um, places like that, Georgia. Now they were making a trek up to Philadelphia, New York, hmm. Baltimore. So you had this 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 migration to the Midwest and to the North. Man, that's interesting too, because to this day, I've met so many people from Chicago. Who has a grandmother, a great grandmother, in Mississippi, aunt in Mississippi yeah. and and same thing with California and, and like somebody either in Texas, Louisiana. So, so one way the word was being spread. Um, okay, before we even get to the, the word being spread, so the railroad trains, mm -hmm. and that's a, that's pivotal to how word was being spread. So you had the railroads that, that's leading you. Okay. So now if 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 I'm in Mississippi, I can catch a train and go to Chicago. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm in Florida, now I left out Florida. If I'm in Florida, South Carolina, uh, North Carolina, I can catch that train line. It's taking me further up north. I can go. I can stop Philly, okay. Baltimore, New York. Um, so now you got, you got the train line. So one thing was they were offering free fare on mm. the trains what? for blacks that wanted. Or, or it was either free or you got like a discounted rate. In Chicago, what they were doing, one of the oldest black Chicago newspapers, the, the Chicago Defender, um, the press was very heavy back then. Mm. So, yeah, it wasn't social media like we had, yeah. but the newspaper. Yeah. So they were sending newspapers. Newspapers was, were, were getting down south, and there was a lot of propaganda basically saying, hey, and I'm paraphrasing, y'all yeah. need to get out of the south, man. It's, it's better out here in Chicago, man. You, man. You know, you could, man it's not a hard sell for what they were going through. And then through. they had yeah. labor agents that were coming from the north to recruit mm. blacks from the south. 
I had I've never heard about that railroad uh, either free or heavily discounted fare. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. Hey, cause Southwest so, Southwest are blessing blessing us <laughs> melanated folks with them free free yeah, fire miles. Yeah, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm in the world. <laughs> I'm yeah, out here. Like, right. hey, you yeah. know. So hey. So you know. So people say, well, this influx of of black people moving on moving up north. Then you had family members once they left, they were mailing other family members like, hey, you know. Okay. Kind of is that kind of like similar to how the modern day like a lot of uh, Mexicans when they come to uh, come to like Texas come get settled in they're they're immediately bringing maybe yeah yeah it, it could be could be similar like writing back home and and, and letting them know okay. or sending for for other people but the labor agents and they had to be very particular because of course the southern whites they didn't want you coming and you know because they were hard hit economically. Mm -hmm because of what was going on with, with the cotton and, and all the other stuff. And then you had black people want to leave. So now you got access to, um, to the railroad, to catching the train. Okay. You know it's job opportunity. The newspaper, they're, they're, they've been um, sending newspapers down. So you know, okay, yeah. hey, it's job, it's opportunity. And at that time, I want to say 90% of blacks were in the South mm. around this time. Okay. But then when we started migrating, and you start moving and you go up north and you get somewhere like Harlem, we eventually became like 66%. Yeah. And I know that we summer. were at 40, I know in, in the South, we were 40% of the voting base. During that migration from 1916 to 1940, it was 1. 1.6 million blacks leaving the South, mm. going to the that's Midwest yeah. and going out to the North. So that's okay. a, for that time period, that's a big migration. Mm hmm. You know, and, and that's that first. That's the first migration. So the newspaper, the press, the mm -hmm. labor agents going down. It's like a recruiter yeah. coming down to get you to work. You got reduced or free train fare. Anything that mm -hmm. we could do to get you because we got job opportunity. We need people. We need labor. Hmm. Black folks needed jobs. Okay. So that's one way of getting out there to answer the how. Because we hear Harlem and we hear this renaissance. But we don't really delve into the southern influence because you don't have a Harlem Renaissance without the South. Yeah, no, most definitely. It just doesn't happen. And a lot of people uh, coming from the South, you know, wanted up playing like pretty much like foundational roles. There was progress being made in New York at the time, but as far as uh, the establishment of the black arts being celebrated as a you know art form, you think about the Harlem Renaissance. What the Harlem Renaissance did. A lot of what hip hop did, but they did it, you know, um, with a lot less resources. I mean, they they lit legitimized and modernized. I mean, we had we had already created jazz, but you know, um, the amount of stars and the amount of people that that you know uh, came from that period, yep. um, and the amount of the influence of the South. You know, again. yeah. I mean, Mississippi, the, the Delta blues going up to Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm from Mississippi. I'm going to so now I'm bringing blues. To Chicago, yeah, most you know, definitely. jazz is coming out of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So Louis Armstrong, okay, Louis Armstrong went to Chicago. Then Louis Armstrong end up around 1925. He ends up in New York, hmm. and he's considered a, a most of the jazz books I read a genius. Yeah, no, but he definitely. still came at the Southern Negro with that that yeah. you know that that Southern. So even that that dichotomy of the intellectual Northern Negro. And this old Southern Negro. Yeah. Man, you know, um, and too, like, even the, the, the Ellington to Louis Armstrong comparisons, it reads like uh, East Coast rap. Oh, yeah, because Duke was New York. He's a New York guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duke is New York all day. So, yeah. New Polish, this, that, and the other. You yeah. know, Louis Rass, this. Yeah, a lot of people, they, they didn't like Louis. They thought, you know, Satchmo, they thought Louis Armstrong was kind of like a, uh, like he was shucking or something. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, it's and it's it's amazing though so how deep rooted a lot of those narratives are about you know just that whole north you know I was about to say north side south side <laughs> but that whole northern you know southern influence thing uh -huh. yeah um, because Duke was, okay Duke was playing at the at the at the kind of club and you know just for date wise so around 1923 and I know we're kind of jumping and we'll we'll circle back but he's playing at the Cotton Club uh, so think about the irony you're in New York. You're playing at the what? The Cotton, Cotton Club. Club. Hey, that's funny. That so is, now, that is hilarious. Around that time, even though you're in the, the, the so-called liberal North, 
Mm-hmm. At the Cotton Club, the only thing you could do, I could do, is serve and perform mm-hmm. for these white folks that's coming in. Mm-hmm. That's all you could do. Yeah, that's heavy right there. So, and then, and then, because you're kind of playing off of the theme of the plantation, it's the Cotton Club. These yeah. black folks, they here to they here to serve us and give us the entertainment. Dance and play your music for us and serve us. No, nah, most definitely. So, One of the surprising things to me, uh, well, first I'll tell you a funny thing is a lot of people who, when they came to Harlem, you know, they would stay in a, a really a well-known, like, uh, basically kind of would be their equivalent of, um, what's it called? Like, a not a boarding house, but uh, like a rooming house, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Langston Hughes came through here, several others. And they called it Niggerati. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that, was, that was their little clique with yeah. Langston Hughes and Zora and then the yeah. writers. Because, okay, Langston is coming from Missouri. Mm-hmm. You know, once word starts spreading, now people want to go out to Harlem. But yeah. then the other question is, okay, why leave the South? Why are you migrating? Why are you going in this direction? In particular, to Harlem, to New York. Secondly, how did you get work? How did, how did you know um, the job opportunities were here in the North? Most so, definitely. okay. Then secondly, how does Harlem become Harlem? Oh, that's, that's, that was super interesting. Like, even to, to learn about the white Harlem and Harlem being a middle-class white neighborhood and the extent that they went to to try to block initially, like, even with like Hudson Realty and yeah, it was Harlem started. It was Dutch, Irish. It was Dutch, Irish, Italian, Jewish, white. All of that. Yeah, what that's else? crazy. That's crazy. And for them it to be with willing, the Dutch. Yeah, <laughs> and they were buying build. They were buy buildings just to evict black people and stop, you know, the influx of black people. Well, they had the um, the developers were were kind of being overly ambitious. This is for, for the, 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 the date people. Mm-hmm. 1904, the developers come out to Harlem, and what's going, what's, what's going to happen is they're going to build a, a subway. They okay. had the, the um, you know, I'm not from the north, whatever, the, the rail that goes above. Yeah, but in 1904, I, they I, built I, the, uh, uh, the monorail, whatever they would call it. 1904, they built the subway, and they got this, uh, I want to say it's the Lenox Avenue, so the developers are thinking, all right, they're going to build this subway. The subway's built in 1904. The developers were looking at the land prior to it being completed in 1904, saying, okay, let's buy out all these tenements. Because once mm-hmm. the subway is complete, man, they're going to be able to go here, 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 and here. This is where it backfired. Yeah, you were able to, 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 to go from Harlem to other places, but it also benefited some of these other borough, bureau, uh, boroughs. Mm-hmm. In New York, this this my. I'm not an East Coast dude, so I don't know. You know the borough. Yeah. <laughs> so that was going to the Bronx and some of these some of these other places. So you got all these tenements that they call apartment tenements, and you can't sell them. Mm-hmm. And strangely enough, too, as as you know, economically deprived as uh, we were, you know, black people were basically food to these uh, these developers because we paid a higher rent. And obviously, we had less less complaints and different things of that. You didn't have to meet a lot of the same standards. Yep. And um, I know at one point, uh, I think the average rent was, the average salary for a black person working full-time was $20 a month. And the average rent was $24 a month. And that's like, wow. Like, to even think about it, like, your average, yeah, yo. Yeah, the cost of living. Yeah, that yeah. cost of living is crazy. For you, for you to have to work and save every penny at your job and still not be able to afford an average yeah, you, uh, yeah. you know living standard that's a you know that's, that's just a you still in the, in the negative so one of the questions is how harlem becomes black yeah now the developers being overly ambitious mm-hmm. developing all of this now you can't really sell it you're yeah. sitting on it you it's like you're building the the, the you know you had the, the promise of, oh, uh, the subway is complete. People are going to be knocking down the doors to move in. Mm-hmm. One of the um, critical names in the Harlem Renaissance. Remember not this, an artist. Folks. This about to be, you about to hear a star right here. Not an artist, not a poet, not any of the, 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 the glitz and glare that gets associated with the Harlem Renaissance mm-hmm. is uh, Philip Payton Jr. 
who was considered uh, what they call him the uh, the father of Black Harlem. Hmm. He started. He was one of the founders of the uh, African American realty. Amazing. It's amazing, brother, to learn about. I mean, I was just another. You know, one thing on this journey, we've learned about so many brilliant people that I literally had never heard of before this week. Um, so, just in learning about his story of, how, what, didn't he start off at the, as a janitor or like super low level? Uh, yeah, well, he, he wasn't from Harlem. He migrated to Harlem. He was a barber. His dad was a barber, so he learned. He, he, was, a, he was cut from the Booger T. Washington Club. Okay. Of you have to have some kind of trade. Okay. So, he was a barber. But then he became a janitor at a, a, at a, 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 a realty that was owned by some white folks. And he was kind of learning the game as a janitor. Hmm. And then one of, the, one of the things about him that was critical to the development of Harlem and Harlem becoming uh, populated with black people was he was able to, you had this d- dispute with these, these landlords of the okay. property. So what one of them did was they hired him to manage, kind of be a property manager or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they said, hey, go out and, you know, find some Negroes. This, yeah. is, how they, this is what they're telling him at this time. Mm-hmm. You rent it out to the Negroes, it's going to move the white people out. Yeah. The other properties where mm-hmm. I'm having this dispute with this other landlord. Yeah. So mm-hmm. now... Political currency. One of the um, big black newspapers uh, out of New York. Uh, one thing I want to say is called the New Age. They were able to put in ads for uh, Philip Payton Jr. Hmm. And then he became one of the, the landlords. So he's a, he's a property manager and he was able to recruit, get black people to move out to Harlem. And hmm. eventually he started his own with uh, the African American realty. So the critical thing about that is it kind of delves back into Booker T. Washington because he had the, uh, uh, what, what did they call it? Let me. Uh, well, you're saying that, you know, I was listening to that story and, and it, what jumped out to me again was like, you know, the appreciation of an opportunity that the ancestors had. And, you know, while you're looking that up, I just kind of wondered sometime, what, how can we reclaim that spirit of like, this is an opportunity. I'm gonna start as a janitor. Like, hey, I mean, you know, some people have it, and and well, to me, it's the uh, it's the importance of, of learning your history to know that people did that. If you talk to people in your family, they had they they had to work their way to get something. Nothing was handed yeah. to a lot of people back then. So we take a lot of things for granted now. Mm-hmm. But you gotta think during this time period, nobody was giving you anything. You had to work hard for it. So it was, it was the, um, the National Negro Business League, mm, okay. founded in 1900. That's something that Booker T. Washington started. And when we do an episode on Booker T., we, we can delve into it. But they had a huge influence on uh, Philip Payton Jr. So now he gets with some, some more prominent people, and they start buying our property. Because remember, the more blacks that are moving in, the whites are leaving. So it's hmm. almost like blacks are gentrifying Harlem in a, in a, in a sense of the white folks are like, hey, That's we'll leave. And now, because they were evicting black people, then he was able to start evicting white people. <laughs> and then buying up certain tenements, certain apartments. And then also you had the, um, that uh, Episcopal church, which yeah. is one of the oldest um, black and richest churches in Harlem. Yeah. They bought about 13 apartment buildings. So just and evicted all the white white people. So just from the the spirit of uh, Philip Payton. Now, mind you, this is before the 1920s when he's doing this because he died at 41. Man. He died in like 1917. Hmm. So, but he was able to accumulate the the real estate yeah. from being inspired by Booker T. Booker T. was like, hey, black people need to own land. Hmm. Own a house, own a home. This is where your, you know, your, your um, our currency can come from. So now, word is getting around. Okay, if there's no, if nobody else wants you, you can go and live in Harlem. Mm-hmm. Black people are buying up the property. 
So now he starts this African-American realty. Mm -hmm. And this ushers in people to start moving into Harlem. And it all started with that dispute, those two landlords. It's like, yeah. hey, you got your, oh, I got to get, I, I need people moving into my apartments. Yeah. Oh, you know, hey. And that's the you, really you, look. You 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 feel the pain, Junior. Hey man. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, you if you if you get some some can you get some Negroes to move in my apartment? Because if you get these Negroes, then the white folks that's living over in his property they'll leave. I believe I can, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then eventually you're learning the game. Nah, most definitely. And then, and then you eventually start owning your own. Now you're owning your own property. Mm-hmm. And look, I think about now you can lease it out. His when you brought up Booker T too, uh, I thought about that Tupac quote. Like I, I may not be the one, but I'll inspire the the one who who does, you mm -hmm. know, and who 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 does bring change. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, and this just you know, to hear like this guy is basically using the tools that were installed, you know, in him, uh, uh, you know, a generation before, mm -hmm. and and he's created something. That led yeah. to, you know, basically that. Yeah, I think he had two sisters that went to Yale. And yeah. he's leaving to, you know, and his mom's like, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, hey, I'm going to go figure it out. And he became a barber and became a janitor and he leveraged it. Yeah, most definitely. So now Harlem is becoming occupied by black people. So now, you know, you're getting 50, 70,000. You're getting, you know, Thousands and thousands of black people because they have a place that they can stay and live comfortably. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, this is the liberal north. But what are the white folks doing? Black people move in, we yeah. want to move out. Yep. Because remember, this is originally before the developers were getting overly ambitious. This is Dutch, Irish, German, Jewish mm -hmm. populated area. So now what we can leave out around this same time as Harlem is progressing in 1916, a brother, Marcus Garvey, comes into Harlem, yes. all the way from Jamaica. And we talked about, we had our episode, we talked about Marcus Garvey. So Garvey had plays a part in this, what we call Harlem Renaissance. And also just migration-wise too, where, you know, we talked about that the were, States, but that Harlem yeah, was a destination the Caribbean, for Caribbean yeah, migration. Yeah, one of, the, one of the famous poets, Claude, Claude McKay, um, was another brother that came from Jamaica, so yeah, it it was it also became a place for a lot of uh, the Caribbean brothers and sisters mm -hmm. to go. So, mm -hmm. once again, inspired by Booker T. Washington, yeah, Marcus Garvey. So he goes goes to Harlem. Hey, it's one the the thing about Garvey is that he was able to connect with the southern the the people that were already from the north. They had a little bit of a disdain. Yeah. Brothers coming from the South. Like, oh, okay. It's almost like now we go and they say, oh, you're a Bama. You, you're yeah, South Bama. Right. Yeah. Garbage mm -hmm. kind of strikes me as like a uh, uh, kind of pimp C ish. You know, he can uh, reach the common man. Yeah. You know, so he had like certain, that certain commonality about him. Um, you know, and, and, but you know, a lot of times people who have like that bold commonality and that 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 can be that can rub, especially even to this day, that sometimes rubs the intellectual community a little bit wrong. Yeah. You know? So so now we got the the investment groups that are investing in Harlem to make it as as black as they can make it. Yeah. So now we get to this is this is the destination. Go to Harlem. W. E. B. Du Bois has a stake. Mm -hmm. In Harlem. Now we're talking about just, just people that have a stake in the Harlem Renaissance that are not necessarily artists, poets. Yeah. You know, this is the intellectual side or the, um, the nationalist side with, with um, someone like Marcus Garvey. The intellectual side of W.E.B. Du Bois. He started Crisis, mm -hmm. which was a magazine with the NAACP. Yeah. Remember, he's one of the founders of the NAACP. So he starts Crisis, which is more of a political type magazine mm -hmm. that comes out but then he gets an editor he kind of delves into into the arts around uh i want to say 1921 to uh he has this editor jesse Forsett. why is she critical now she's editing and now you're getting these these editorials where she's uh getting artists mm -hmm. now you get this young guy 
1921, by the name of Langston Hughes, he writes a poem, they publish it, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Hmm. So now, you remember, Langston Hughes like, hey, I need to go to Harlem. Yeah. The word starts to spread. Word, you know, think about, uh, think about us in, uh, as, as a people, where there's opportunity for us to express ourselves, be recognized and be compensated, we, we flood to, you know, and that's pretty much to this day, you know. Um, but I think what the boys also did that I thought was important was even though he wasn't necessarily like a, I guess an artist, he set the tone uh, as far as the uh, philosophy behind what would be a lot of the tenets. Yeah. Um, and I liked like some of even his uh, four, I don't, know if, I don't know if these would be his four rules, but the, uh, we're going to do theater and it needs to be about us, by us, for us, and near us. And that was like a, a, a real platform that really introduced uh, a, a change of, of philosophy where it was like, hey, we don't have to, you know, be caricatures or, you know, uh, make a fool out of ourselves to have art be uh, accepted or, you know, be have, ex experience some level of commercial success. And I think um, that was really uh, strikes as a pivotal point because it gave black creatives a chance to create like legitimate modern art without having to play up to anyone's, you know, societal and particularly yeah, having like to play, you know. Black, yeah, I like the way you say black creatives because that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good way of, of describing it because Jessie Frissette, she was the editor from uh, 1918 to 1926. But mm -hmm. it's almost like saying she kind of, put Langston on yeah. in, 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 in a sense. That makes sense. Because after that, he gets that, that, that poem published. Now, word spreads. Yeah, I mean, the publication was the, was the record label. That was, back yeah, then. That, was, that, was, mm -hmm. that was the way to get out. But then, what we call the Hall of Renaissance is also the other name that could be attributed to it is the New Negro mm -hmm. Movement, which oh, Alan God. Locke, which was a man, <laughs> or Elaine, it's... It, some people say Allen, some people say Elaine Locke. This brother, you gotta think, he went to Harvard for philosophy. Got a hmm. PhD from Harvard. He's from Massachusetts area. Yeah, some cold in brothers. philosophy. There's, some, there's been some cold brothers that didn't touch yeah, foot on this. this uh, I'm a reaper. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, Oxford scholar. Man. Um, ended up teaching um, at Howard for 40 years. Hmm. Philosophy. But he was the editor of this anthology, and they called it the, uh, the New Negro Movement. It was kind of one of the other names outside of the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, I feel that. So like, now, you, you know, he's a part of, but then you also had this dynamic of, like, the old guard, the new guard. You got the, the mm. young artists that are coming in, uh, the young creatives, the black creatives. Then you got, like, the James Weldon, James Weldon Johnson, the same guy that wrote the... the um, Lift every voice and sing. We call it the Negro National Anthem, yeah. but it's really lift every voice and sing. He's a, he's probably in his fifties around this time, hmm. so he's in that in in that same uh, era of Du Bois. Yeah. So now you got that dynamic, hmm. and then you got this young lady coming from Edenton, born in Alabama, coming from Edenton, uh, Florida. That's Zora Neale Hurston. So now she went to Howard. And now she's a part of the Harlem Renaissance. Can't leave out the sisters. No, most definitely, most definitely can't. We can't leave out the sisters. So now we're getting into the the, the black creatives. You also coined the nigger Roddy Yeah, too. yeah. Was a, was a so they had that the nigger too. You know, a, a, a lot of different. You know, a lot of different names with all these different creatives. The thing about Zora Neale was that uh, she was studying anthropology. She had a degree in anthropology. Wow. Okay. Outside, outside of, you know, being a well, how she described coming, huh? I, I just wonder that just I'm just thinking like Oh. Um but you know, making that trick now so we've we you know, we're painting the picture and, and painting the scene. Like you said, the Harlem Renaissance, we always think of the, the black creators. We always think about oh, uh, black people were painters, they were all, uh dancers, singers, um uh, the music, but the Southern influence and how we got there, mm -hmm. that migration, what it led to, Harlem, 
how did Harlem become this mecca of black people? No, because it definitely. didn't start like that. It, it, you know, none of this was uh, created in a vacuum, as, as they would say. This is uh, things were moving and pieces were in motion. You had Marcus Garvey and what he was doing mm -hmm. and starting his organization. You got W.E.B. Du Bois and the form, um, and NAACP. And you got these artists. You got people like Langston Hughes. You got people like Zora Neale Hurston. Think about it. They were in college. They were going, you know, hey, going to Columbia or going to Howard and come. You got a guy like uh, Alan Locke out there that's just a scholar amongst scholars. Hmm. So then the question is, and you had the artists, someone, let's say like Aaron Douglas. The, the critical thing about uh, Alan Locke, to some extent, Aaron, Aaron Douglas, which was the, the visual artist, Langston Hughes, and Zora Neale Hurston. Now the question is, how was money being made? Hmm. That's a good question. And I think... Uh, so Harlem Renaissance, right? This, this renaissance of blackness, of what you call it, black creators? Mm -hmm. So how am I making money? Who hmm. is patronizing me? And Who that, are the... the <laughs> The original GoFundMe, <laughs> you know. The, so the, the two, and they still call it. They still have Patreon to this day. Hey man, yeah. Like, hey, hey, so the, the patrons. You have to yeah. have a patron of the arts, most definitely, to survive. Remember, most. it's always been some form of philanthropy, most right? definitely. Um, so the names, um, the names I just said, they had a godmother, Charlotte mason that's they called her godmother this rich white woman you know just rich mm. she had langston hughes or neil hurston aaron douglas ellen lock when i say had meaning she was paying them like stipends she's paying langston hughes about 150 dollars a month paying zora neil hurston 200 dollars a month okay mm. you go right but she wanted somewhat of some control langston is writing okay i want to know what you now with Langston Hughes, she didn't have as much control. She didn't want as much control as she had over someone like Zora Neale. Okay. And Zora, just to celebrate the queen on her birthday, Zora was another coming from the South. She wrote in this, what they call a, a, a dialect. Hmm. You know, she wrote like the people that she grew up around. Hey, boy, what, what they finna do around there? You know, yeah. it was no, written in the, in the dialect. No, that's dope. You taking yeah. that up north? You taking yeah. them country rap tunes up north? What did the uh, godmother want in return for the for that free lunch? Well, control. Her it, it was it was it was the control because what? it was another patron. But he was he was cut from the cloth of an artist, Carl Van Vechen. And he was a photographer. A lot of the pictures he took around hmm. the Harlem Renaissance. Okay. White man. He was very close with uh, with Langston Hughes. It was almost like. Collecting Negroes. I have a. I have. I have these artists. These are. These are mine. So at that point, um, I guess in the just progression of the arts in general, is it a situation? Uh, you know, this would probably be more of a music, uh, book publishing industry type of thing. Where our royalty is it? Did she want some type of ownership of their work? Or? No, because um, Langston was able to. They had publishers. Um, around that time, a lot of the the blacks were doing like magazines and anthologies, but then a lot of the publishing houses were white. Okay. Around that time, so it wasn't that she needed to eat off of their work. She already had money. But even then, you're writing, um, you're publishing books. I mean, I don't know how much money they were getting at that time. I don't know if it was. A, it's like getting an advance. You, you want to compare it to music? Okay, I give you an advance. I give you an advance, but remember, a record deal is nothing but a loan. Yeah. And it's a way, at the, I, I see, just maybe purely speculative, speculatively, you know, it, I can see how, you know, this is a wave, and you can see that clearly this thing is growing. And I can see how there's always been, you know, uh, as crazy as, as volatile as our historic relationship has been, there's always been white curiosity into you know yeah black you know van vetchen carl van vetchen wrote a book about harlem this is a white man he wrote a book called nigger heaven 
with the, with the, with the hard ER, not with the, it wasn't with the A back then. I mean, either way, I mean, but yeah. it was the and it was a success, but it was still one of those things where it was like, you know how it's like you you yeah. you think you a little too nigger heaven. You, That's you 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 know you a little too. Hey, I'm around y'all. Yeah, I'm yeah. you know I'm I'm the one white guy coming out of Greenwich Village because before they had the before the the, um, the Harlem Renaissance, you had this other lady, uh, Mabel. I can't think of her last name, but she was hosting these. What they call, they they were calling them salons. Okay. And they had all these artists, and and that dates all the way back to some French elite. Okay. Type. You're sitting around and we're all, you know, at the dinner table. We have, any, we have these conversations. So this is going on, but she wasn't really trying to fool with black folks. Yeah. Carl was the dude that's like, hey, I got some black friends. Let me, let me okay. bring them over. But they're going to sing and dance for y'all a little bit. Okay. He, he, he wanted to be that kind of that white guy. Yeah. But then you write a book, satire a little bit. This but you're talking about Harlem. I mean, it wasn't like, I, you know, from, from what I understand, I, I'm not sure if it was like, I don't think he was being negative toward black folks, but it's like a white guy writing a book called Nigger Heaven in reference to uh, Harlem. So this, ain't, this, this, isn't, this isn't no Thaddeus Stevens riding going on. This is more no, of a No, 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 no. He, he wasn't one of the radical. <laughs> no, so it, just, it ain't nothing radical. It's just curiosity. <laughs> no, nah, he wasn't a radical Republican. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I think he one was, of the things. He, he was a patron that. You start, you start getting too comfortable. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be... Let's take it to modern times, right? Let's just say if Jimmy Iovine was like that. I got Dr. Yeah. Dre and I'm around, and, you know, and then, or, or Jerry Heller. I'm yeah. collecting NWA. I got Easy e I got Some would say that was, he, he did try that, you know. You so know. It, what I'm saying is this, is this has always been going on. Yeah, and the, and the thing about it, I was just thinking uh, when you were describing some of a lot of the people who were down there and the makeup of it creatively is... Like living in the living in that era, if you're if you're an MC today, you rhyme. You're a writer back then. You're a poet back then. You yeah. know, if you're into you know uh, filmmaking or this or another, you're you're the a theater, theater right yeah. back then. So it was like the same spirit. You know. Yeah, but that, that's why I always um I had to give credit to Langston Hughes because um as a poet, he I mean he was he was an innovator. During that Harlem Renaissance. So when you see certain names stick out, I mean, it's, there are a lot of names that if you go down a list of artists and writers and playwrights, but some of the main ones, Langston is always going to be the one that sticks out as, mm -hmm. as more of the commercially known name associated with the Harlem Renaissance. And I would say rightfully so, because as a poet, he was doing, he was doing jazz poetry. Hmm. He was doing blues poetry. And he was considered one of the first pro-black type poets, even though... You know, back then, compared to, let's say, what maybe the last poets were saying, it was totally different, yeah. but it was still considered radical for that time. He was a playwright. Mm -hmm. He was writing songs. He was, uh, his friendship with Zora Neale basically became a more of a feud, and, and sadly, um, they were not cool. They were writing a play together. Yeah. And she didn't agree, and, and I think she took the play and, you know, published it or put it out on her own. So that, mm -hmm. that caused a rift between them. And I don't know if they ever spoke again, but Langston would still write letters to the, the white patron, the godmother, or whatever, mm -hmm. because even that relationship severed. Yeah. So if we start getting toward the tail end of the Harlem Renaissance, so the, the peak, I would say, was a lot of people say that 1920 to... 1929 like yeah. they nine one thing i think yeah. we got to make sure we give like uh you know people there just uh insight on is the theater i don't know what would the, what would be called a theater club theater troop theater but anyway the names were like the anita bush the bush players the acme players hmm. and i forgot what the charles I gibbling players exactly yeah. and I, I don't know what it's called uh, was it a theater troop a theater it may be, uh, yeah. yeah so but basically uh you know theater organizations that really opened up a new door because before then, you know, uh, there were plays that were being written, you know, about, I mean, in, as early as 1903, you have a, a play of, written by black people, but it was really, you know, that Bojangles, 
you know, that type of thing. It wasn't necessarily telling authentic stories about us. It was a real limited caricature of us. And then as, a, as we progressed, they actually started having stories written about, you know, the Negro experience. But the crazy thing about this is that uh, the cast would be all white. You know, if you look at uh, uh, Ridley Torrent, and he had uh, three plays, three Negro plays that had all white cast. Wow. And like, uh, and this is an award-winning playwright. He was, wow. you know, being celebrated for his work. And, um, and it was like revolutionary when finally he uh, had an all-black cast for his three mm. black plays. And critics said that, you know, the actors weren't good. <laughs> like, it was, like, it was amazing to hear, like, to read it, to critique. Yeah, they, 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 a lot of crits yeah, came it's like, out of that era. But now the, the, it came back to me, the lady, uh, Maybell or Mabel Dodge was the lady that hosted the salons that Carl Van Vetchett came out of. But then when you look at the patronage, the closest you may have had to black patronage back then, but it, it, it still didn't work. She was hosting salons, Aaliyah, um, Walker, Madam C.J. Mm. Walker's daughter, wow, okay. was very rich around that time, and she lived in Harlem, and she hosted these salons for people to come, and Langston Hughes would come, and, and you know sometimes they would do poetry or sit around and have different discussions, but it, there was never, from what I understand, a a, a, a black consolidated patronage of the arts to sustain itself in Harlem. So then you had the people like Langston Hughes who would, you know, write essays like the, uh, the Negro and the Racial Mountain. I'm saying a young poet or a young artist is saying, no, I'm just a writer. He's saying, no, you're a Negro writer. Mm. So I think that was important. And I think uh, also, and I do think going as the, the evolution of, the, of the, the play, and really that was one of the first times us being able to actually act out our stories um, mm -hmm. and, and really show and display whether it was like, uh, I think 1979, Rachel, uh, the black story. Yeah, about, Paul you know, Robeson was around. He was doing theater yeah. around that time. And that was a time mm -hmm. when we were able to actually, you know, make the transition to really authentically telling our story and, you know, uh, following the, the credence of, of Du Bois, which was the initial intent of stories, you know, for us, about us, near us, and really attempting to build a community around uh, the arts. And I think the challenge for the Harlem Renaissance is, is a challenge for building, you know, to this day, the challenge for building um, a, a, a hip hop scene in the city, you know, commercial, I mean, uh, really having the financial resources to, the, to sustain an ecosystem and not necessarily sustain your your you know Pareto principle your your twenty percent yeah and and that that challenge still remains you know um, and I think for the Harlem Renaissance even heading in that direction but then coming into as fate would have it a, you know a Great Depression you know yeah um, nineteen twenty nine ushered in the, the the stock market crash and the Great Depression and you know the, that patronage. You know, slow down. When when money gets tight, the first thing that goes is like commodities. You know, yeah. and, and I mean, yeah, art, the, art. Unfortunately, it's not a necessity. Yeah, you don't it, need. Art. You know, I mean, some people may beg to differ, but you don't need art. To, you need food, clothing, and shelter. But yeah, you don't necessarily need art. Yeah, no. Nah, hey, look. Hey, things get tight. Then you know, I, I'm not buying a concert ticket. You know, I'm mm. not buying that. You know, it's just it's not a. It's, you know, there may be an artist who, you know, but as a, as a whole, art as a whole, it's really, I mean, something that is hard to sustain during a time of, you know, depression and, and that going on. And, you know, looking back at it, I don't know. I mean, it's hard. It's easy to look at things with 2020 eyes and, hey, this, that, and other. It seemed like they did everything right. You know, I mean, mm. I, I don't, maybe does the church... It's after buying the buildings, could there have been a... I, I don't know what, what they could have done well, differently strategy uh, I'm going to read something. Um, it was a quote in, in regards to black patronage. It said, mm -hmm. Negroes of Harlem have never achieved economic control inside Harlem. Mm. So it said, um, 
Negroes of Harlem have never achieved economic control inside Harlem or inside any other major black community. Mm. So that was in response to why there was no black patronage. You're not controlling the economics in your own community amongst your own people. And then also the Great Depression happens. Then the politics of what was going on. Now you start people start separating on politics. Socialist. Du Bois is pushing or some would say he was more of a socialist. Claude McKay. Then he had people that were associated with communism. Some say Langston Hughes was leaning toward communism. Just kind of then now you got a riff with Claude McKay and and um even though he's from the Caribbean He's a uh, Jamaican brother, and Garvey's a Jamaican brother. They have a real, they don't agree on the politics. Let me ask you this, though. If, if they were doing plays, right, I'm assuming they're doing plays, they weren't doing it for free. They're doing performing. I'm, I'm assuming they weren't performing for free. Books are being sold, magazines. Where's the money going? Like, where, somebody should be eating, right? If you're doing. Well, I mean, it's a limited amount of time. You're, you're talking about something from 1920 to 1929. How long do you have to sustain? How, how, I mean, how rich are you getting within that? You do a play. If, you, you, if, if a person is an actor or an actress, it's a gig to gig thing. Mm. You know, you, I mean, um, you're trying to sustain yourself for the long run. No, so the, the, the politics behind it. But one person I will say, because, because it's her birthday, but Zora Neale Hurston, she continued to put out a lot of stuff in the 30s, hmm. even after the Hall of Renaissance. Unfortunately, she died broke. Yeah. Langston Hughes. One thing about Langston Hughes, he kept it's in his integrity. Of, it's almost like I'm not selling out. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise my art or anything that I'm doing for the sake of Okay, this is this is what white people want of black people. Oh, they want the stereotypical thing. Oh, they want this. Mm-hmm. Oh, they want that. So you you're keeping this integrity. And one of the things I read about with Zora Neale Hurston was that um, supposedly they were to burn all of her manuscripts after mm. she died, and someone came and was actually able to save a lot of the manuscript from the fire. Mm. Man, and that that's... may have been associated with the um the patronage of of what was going on so 1916 to 1940 we go southern migration we go railroads linking us we go real estate in Mm -hmm. harlem we go music Mm -hmm. in harlem we go arts the black creatives in harlem we go Mm -hmm. white patronage we go stock market crash, Great Depression, and man. Yes. And some people say we romanticize it. Yeah. It wasn't even as much as we thought it was. So in the spirit of Zora Neale Hurston, in the spirit of the black creatives. Hey, you know, but and I just want to say one thing. I, I, I think we still should be celebrating. I know there's a difference between romanticize and, and celebrate, but I don't, yeah. you know, I, I think, yeah, it, it could have been better in certain ways but i think it's still a, a great accomplishment that should be honored you know yeah when you when you look at the harlem renaissance look at it from the lens of all of it not just the art side but how did it get to the art side yeah. this is gentleman's history hour on equality rob j 10x hey y'all check us out on youtube every thursday full episodes drop us a comment tell us what you like tell us what you don't like we're here to inspire you Hey, inspire us. It's a reciprocal process. Peace. Peace. If you're watching this on YouTube, man, hey, y'all, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. This is Gentleman's History Hour.